Thanks so much, Bob. Guys, it's so great to be with you. It's such an honour. This is the, actually my first time that I've been to the CMJ conference and I'm loving it so far. I was with the conference last year digitally. I had the, um, the privilege of being able to share on the online stuff last year, but this is my first time that I've actually been able to be here. Uh, I'm actually part Jewish. Uh, my background on my mum's side of the family is Jewish. We didn't find that out though until quite late uh, in, in my life. My grandfather my, and my grandmother, they were both, they both were very passionate about Israel. Both of them worked for a number of seasons in the garden tomb as chaplains. They've always been, although my, although my grandfather was a Baptist reverend, he acted much more like a rabbi, to be honest with you. And so we just always have had this love of Israel. And then towards the end of his life, we actually found out that his granddad, who had passed away before he was born, uh, was an Orthodox Jew uh, who had married a Gentile lady and kind of been rejected by his community. And so suddenly all these things started to kind of fall into place. And we thought, oh, now it makes so much sense why we have this passion and this love for both the land and the customs of of Israel. And to be honest, growing up, we practiced Shabbat on a regular basis and uh, always would celebrate the Passover. And so I've always had this real love for Israel, been involved with Bridges for Peace uh, and with a number of different organizations. But uh, I, I kind of carry two main responsibilities. Well, my first most important responsibility is that I am married to one wife. Uh, Carolina is my beautiful bride from Colombia. Uh, and we have four kids. Two of them are here with me, uh, ranging from 14 down to seven in age. So they are uh, a whirlwind of activity. I haven't really slept properly for 14 years, uh, but they're absolutely fantastic. They keep me out of mischief. And then I help lead a church on the south coast called Aaron Church. Uh, we're part of the 24-7 prayer network of churches. Uh, we're very heavily involved in the Pioneer Network of Churches and the Ground Level Network of Churches, if you've heard of those. Uh, we host a little event called the Big Church Day Out down on the South Coast. Has any, anybody heard of Big Church Day Out or ever been? To? Okay, fantastic. We have this amazing opportunity. We get like 25,000 people worshipping God on the South Downs. It is really beautiful. Uh, so we're looking forward to being able to do that again in person next year year. Hi there, guys. How are you doing? Don't worry at all. Oh, no worries. Don't worry at all. Yeah, I, I was joking before saying we're talking about worship in the wilderness. I've actually brought wilderness heat to you today so you can feel a little bit of what they must feel in the wilderness. Uh, with my other hat, my other responsibilities, I help lead an organisation called Lynx International. I don't know if you've heard of Lynx International, but we are a, an international development organisation working into 60 different countries around the world, really with a passion to confront poverty, to create potential and to connect people. We work with uh, partners out on the ground who we empower through five main areas of faith, health, business, education and justice, social justice. Uh, really to see communities change and transform. So uh, that's a little bit about what I do. Um, really excited to be here with you today uh, talking about the concept of the wilderness. Now, how many of you know the Jewish people, they really consider themselves as a desert people? They consider themselves as a, a, a wilderness people. If you've ever been in a wilderness, has anybody ever had the opportunity to visit Israel? OK, so you'll know, you see when you go to the Dead Sea and you're in the Judean wilderness, you see there's just like barren. When the Bible talks about a barren wasteland, it suddenly comes to life. There's this huge portion of the land and even more so in, in Bible times that is desert. And so much of the faith of the patriarchs, the faith of our forefathers was forged right in the middle of the wilderness. Now, as Westerners, we don't really understand this. So much of uh, Christianity really has talked about comfort and has talked about a God that wants to bless us and make life great. And I'm not arguing that. I'm not denying that. But to really know Yahweh, to really know God, we will find him when we step into the wilderness. So 
We see, so even even now, actually, you know, if you've been to Israel and you go to the Sea of Galilee, you don't really see cottages around the Sea of Galilee, do you? There's just not there's just not these homes next to the water because there's this there's something within the DNA of the Jewish people that is. Part, partly fearful of water. So the, the, the sea is the place of the abyss. It is the place of the dead. Revelation says that in heaven there will be no sea, right? Because it was seen as the place of the dead. In fact, it, 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 I don't know if you realize this, but Jesus' disciples, they probably didn't even swim, the majority of them. Most of the fishing would have been done along skirting the the. Uh, the, the coastline of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, when the Bible talks about them going into deep water and going across the sea, on every occasion, it's a really dramatic situation that they find themselves in. And one thing that's important to realise is that even before they get into deep water, even before they get out there, they were already fearful. They were already thinking, what on earth are we doing going into the middle of the water? And so we need to realise that when we come to the scriptures that The scriptures are full of these images of the desert. Abraham was a desert man, okay? The the faith of Abraham was forged right in the middle of the wilderness. Moses. Moses spends 40 years in Egypt learning the ways of the Egyptians. And then we know that he takes things into his own hands. And then he flees to the wilderness. And he's there for 40 years in the wilderness. So he spent 40 years of his life thinking that he is preparing to be some great somebody. And then God takes him into a 40-year wilderness experience, and more about 40 later. But he takes him into this 40-year wilderness experience so that Moses can learn that he's actually a nobody. (laughs) And in the wilderness, God meets with him and encounters him in a powerful way, sends him back again to lead the children of Israel out again into a wilderness for 40 years, where they learn to hear the voice of God, where they learn to believe in his presence, in his provision and in his power. And it all happens right there in the wilderness. John the Baptist is this known as this uh, voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. And then Jesus himself, Yeshua, begins his ministry with this 40 day season in the wilderness. So this is so important to understand. So I'm going to do something fun with you. Uh, this is the Shema. This is the most important Jewish prayer. Many of you will know it. I realise here it's so much fun because I'm preaching to the choir. It's great. But uh, this is the Shema. This is the clarion call of the Jewish people. They would pray this six times a day. And this was, you, you had to feel this in your bones that you were here as witnesses to the one true God. So we're going to say this together. Uh, If you feel comfortable, I'd encourage you to stand up in the Jewish setting. When you speak the word of God, when you hear the word of God, you always stand up. Don't feel like you have to. I realize that people are tired, but if you would like to stand up, that would be really great. So we're going to say this together. This is the Shema. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Brilliant. Let's say it again and let's say it with passion. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Now that is just the beginning part of the Shema. That is the Hear, O Israel. The Lord is one. The Lord is our God. Okay, please be seated. It goes on and says, You will love the Lord your God with all of your mind, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul. Brilliant. So we're dedicating ourselves to this moment. So I want to tell you a story just to start off. Uh, About one generation after the time of Jesus, there was a rabbi called Akiba. Anybody here heard of Rabbi Akiba? Awesome. Amazing uh, teacher. We don't really know how much he was influenced by by Yeshua and by his Talmudim. We don't really know, um, although he lived in Capernaum the majority of his lifetime. So he certainly would have been aware of the way. He certainly would have been aware of some of the teachings at least. But there's a great story about Akiva. Um, I don't know if it's apocryphal or if it is actually real, but it goes like this. It says that he was meditating on the words from Isaiah the prophet Where Isaiah says of the Jewish people, you will be my witnesses that the world may know that I am God. You will be my witnesses that the world may know that I am God. 
And there he is, and he's walking along by the shore of Galilee, and he's meditating in the, this scripture. Now, if you've ever seen Jewish people meditating in the scriptures, it is absolutely wonderful. That word to meditate means to like to chew over, to mutter is actually what it really means, to, to speak it over and over and over again. The idea is kind of like, you know, when you get a really great piece of steak, and you've got to chew it to get the juices out and to get the flavour out. And there he is, and he's saying, God, I want to be a witness for you, every fibre of my being, God. I want the world to know that you are real. And he's, and he's meditating on the scriptures, and it begins to get dark, really dark. Now, there's no street lamps. There's no torch that he can pull out of his pocket. He can't whip out his iPhone and put on the, the, uh, the lamp app on there or anything like that. And so it is dark. And I, I, I travel a lot for my work. I often find myself in, uh, in Africa, Latin America, India, places where there's no electricity. And when it gets dark, you sometimes can't see your hand in front of your face. And Rabbi Akiba begins to make his way back to his home in Copernicum. And he ends up taking a wrong turning in the fork in the road. And he winds up right outside a Roman fortress. In fact, archaeologists have found this not so long ago. And he winds up right outside there and he hears a voice boom out of the darkness saying, who are you and what are you doing here? He's shocked now. He's like, where am I? What's going on here? And then he hears the voice again saying, who are you and what are you doing here? And he thinks to himself for a moment and he responds. He sees the the Roman soldier on the rampart and he says, hey, uh, how much do you get paid to ask me those two questions? And now the Roman soldier's like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And he responds and he says, well, I get paid six drachma. And Rabbi Akiba, in an amazing rabbinical Jedi move moment, turns around and says to him, look, I will pay you double if you stand outside my door. And every morning when I get up and when I leave, you ask me those two questions. Who are you and what are you doing here? So those are the questions, right? I mean, those are the questions they burn in us, don't they? Like from a very young age, this question of who am I? I mean, who am I really and what am I doing here? I mean, what are you doing here at the CMJ conference? I mean, this is awesome. What are we really doing here on earth? What is our reason of being? And, and we have different people that declare over us from a very young age, this is who you are. This is what's expected of you, whether it's our parents, whether it's our pastors, whether it is our, uh, our, our teachers growing up. We have all kinds of people saying this is, this is who you are. And we even have our own internal monologue of what we believe about ourselves, don't we? I have a friend who, um, when, his, when his child was born, he lives in the States, and when his child was born, uh, he invited all of his family to come over and to see his child. And they all came and they, and they, they stood in front of the big glass panel and the, all of the babies were there in their, in their cribs. And uh, all of the family starts saying, oh, look, isn't he cute, doesn't he? Oh, look, 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 he's got a nose just like your side of the family. Oh, look, his eyes are just like Auntie Mildred's or whatever. And they start saying all of these different things about this this baby in the, the crib. And my friend just lets them carry on and kind of say everything that they want to say. And then when they finally had exhausted all the things they wanted to say, say, hey, OK, so now let me introduce you to my son over here. And they've been saying all of this stuff over a kid that wasn't even his kid. And, you know, people, they they try to tell us what is expected of us. They try and tell us all the time uh, what the expectations are. And um, I believe the only place that we really find that is when we meet with God. So 50% of the images throughout the Bible are wilderness images. They're images of the desert. And... uh, we know, you know this because, you, because you're here at the CMJ conference, but Christianity has been, has been cut off from its Jewish roots. Now, if I go out here and I get one of these beautiful plants out here, absolutely beautiful, some of the gardens around here, right? And if I cut it off from its root system and I bring it into this room and I set it up, it, it will look nice for a while, right? It will look, it will look pleasant enough. What's going to happen eventually? It's going to die, right? Eventually it's going to die and it's only going to be a withered version of the glory of what it once was. 
I believe that we have done such a disservice by cutting ourselves off from the roots of our faith to a point that there's so many things that we just do not understand. When we read the scriptures, we don't understand because we don't read them in context. We don't read them understanding the geography. We don't read them understanding the language of the time. We don't, we don't read them from a Hebraic mindset. We read them from a Greek mindset. And so we read a number. We read, we read Goliath's um, Goliath's armor, and we want to know how much it weighed, right? We're like, kind of like, well, how much would that be in modern? Like, and we're trying to like work it all out. But to the Jewish person, all they saw was that there are three things that are mentioned that are all mentioned, and the number six is all over everything. If Goliath was wearing a football t shirt, his number would be six, six, six. And so to a Jewish person, it wasn't about the numerical value. It wasn't about the, 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 the weight of it. It was about what Goliath represented. And along comes David. And David comes with his sling and with his stone. And he, and he, he brings down the giant. And what does he do? He goes over and he takes Goliath's sword and he lops Goliath's head off. And every Jewish kid listening to that story is like, yes, God's promise is true. He said that the seed of woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. Here's this guy that represents the serpent. Here's this guy that represents Yahweh. He is doing what the prophecy says, right? But we miss it because we don't understand the Jewish context of the scriptures. We read a story like the story of Deborah. Uh, And I'm way off subject here, but the story of Deborah. Deborah means... Uh, means means honeybee, right? Divash is the word for for honey in Hebrew. Deborah means means honeybee, and there's her commander Barak, which uh, which basically means thunder, right? The, his name means thunder, and thunder comes along to the honeybee and says, "I need your help because my sister is coming to attack us. I need your help." And she says, "Okay, okay, I I I'll be with you. I'll pray for you, but you need to know you're not going to get the glory for this victory." It goes on and Sisera ends up fleeing the armies. And where does Sisera go? Sisera goes and hides out in the tent of a lady called Yael. Yael is the female version of Joel. Can anybody tell me what the name Joel or Yael means? Any ideas? Any ideas? Uh? Uh? Yes, so put them together. Yahweh is... God. Yeah. So that's what the name means. Right. OK. So here we go. We've got Cicero. Does anybody want to hazard a guess at what the name Cicero means? Think about how it sounds. Cicero. Snake. OK. So Cicero means snake. So here's this snake and he's hiding out in the tent of Yahweh is God. This is not going to go down well. Right. Hiding out in the tent of Yahweh is God. And Yael comes and what does she do? crushes the head of the serpent and again it's like wow this is amazing you can tell how excited i get about all of this stuff but i think people would be more excited if they understood the jewish context that it came out from right so 50 percent of the images there are from the wilderness so we're gonna jump into this idea of the wilderness and i'm gonna do a bit of a smorgasbord okay of different images from the wilderness at any point any point at all please interrupt me you don't even have to put your hand up because like that that's the rabbinic way okay i mean they, you know like when jesus is teaching and somebody just shouts out oh bless this the one who yeah i mean that, that was how it would be it wasn't like you know you just uh, sit there listening to somebody talk i mean this is quite greek what we're doing here it'd be so much better if we could just like and find ourselves in the judean wilderness and be able to kind of show you this stuff but i'm gonna show some images and I'm going to talk about some stuff. But if at any point you have a question, please, please do, um, do ask me. And then, of course, we're not, we've not got a, a whole load of time. So if later I'm going to be around, grab me if you've got any questions that you want to, that you want to talk about. So let's start here. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. And I'm going to read, this is from the complete Jewish Bible. Uh, I saw that they've got some over in the bookshop. So if you haven't got one of those, make sure you get it. It's a fantastic translation of the Bible. Um, or if you've got like the U version on your uh, app on your phone or anything, you can get this version for free. Then the spirit led Yeshua up into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary. After Yeshua had fasted 40 days and nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, order these stones to become bread. But he answered, the Tanakh said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of Adonai. 
Then the adversary took him to the holy city, set him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, jump. For the Tanakh said, says, he will order his angels to be responsible for you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not hurt your feet on the stones. Goes on. Yeshua replied to him, but it also says, do not put Adonai, your God, to the test. Once more, the adversary took him up to the summit of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, all their glory and said, all this I will give you. In fact, in the original, it says it has been given to me. If you will bow down and worship me, yes, your replies, away with you, Satan, for the Tanakh says, worship Adonai, your God, and serve only him. Then the adversary left him alone and angels came and took care of him. Well, I want you to notice, first of all in there, the very, very first bit of this portion of scripture. What does it say? What does, who, why did Jesus go into the wilderness? The spirit led him into the wilderness. The spirit took him intentionally into the wilderness. This wasn't a mistake. This wasn't like Jesus kind of thinking, oh, I just need to, I just feel like going over to this part of the country. for this. The spirit led him into this place. Why did the spirit lead him into the wilderness? To be tested. Any other reasons? Yeah. Anything else? It's all great. It's all good. Yeah. Brilliant. Anything else? No wrong answers here. I'm just interested to hear the different views. Anything else? Okay, let's look. So this is Israel. Okay, it's quite a crude crude, uh, map of Israel. But you've got here, you've got the coastal plain. Okay. And then you've got what's known as the Shephelah. Say with me, Shephelah. Can you say that? Shephelah. And then you've got the mountains, the wilderness. Okay. Now, this is, this, so, so it's known as the land of milk and honey, right? But we often don't really understand why it's called the land of milk and honey. You've got in the Sheffler area here in the coastal plains, you have got spectacularly fertile land, beautiful land there, where you can grow all kinds of different uh, plants, all kinds of beautiful things. But then right on the doorstep next to it are the mountains here and the wilderness. You have got a barren wasteland right next to each other. So it's known as the land of milk and honey because in the Shephala and in the coastal plains, you can produce honey because there's plants. So there's bees and you can produce uh, honey. And then in the wilderness area, that would be where the shepherds would live and where the, and they would have goats and the goats would produce milk. It wouldn't have been cows. In fact, there haven't been cows in the promised land for over a thousand years. So, you know, our Christmas cards are completely wrong. Uh, it would have been goats. It would have been sheep. Uh, and this is why you can have areas like Bethlehem. Bethlehem is right on the border between the Shephelah and the mountains, where, where the wilderness and the Shephelah kind of joined together. That's why you could have the story of Ruth, where you've got Boaz, uh, where there are fields, they're growing stuff, but then you've also got shepherds right alongside it. In fact, I know people that live, family that live one mile apart, uh, in Bethlehem, one mile apart, and one of them lives in complete desert, and the other one lives in like beautiful, fertile land. So it's it's absolutely amazing. So you've got these areas there, and God basically says to the children of Israel, "I'm going to take you into this beautiful land where you're going to be able to both produce. There's going to be opportunity for livestock, but there's also going to be farmland. It's going to be productive. It's going to be amazing." And we miss some of the stuff throughout the scriptures because we don't even because we don't understand the geography. Isaiah says at one point, if Isaiah says at one point, he says, if you do not obey the word of the Lord, your God, then I will cause the mountains to run with milk. You ever read that scripture? I can't remember exactly where it is right now, but it kind of sounds like a blessing, doesn't it? Mountains running with milk. That kind of sounds good. But what is Isaiah really saying? He's saying, I will turn the wasteland into a place where I will turn the um, the mountains, the productive area into a place that is no longer productive. Right. So this is this is a close up picture of the Shephelah. And then very close to it, you have the wilderness. Now, in Hebrew, the word for wilderness is the word midbar. Can you say with me midbar? midbar. You heard that before? 
Uh, is it number? Is it the book of Numbers in Hebrew that is called Hamidbar? I think it is in the wilderness. Yeah. So Midbar means wilderness. Okay, and from there, you so you guys know this in Hebrew, you don't have. Con- you don't have vowels, you only have consonants. I mean, there are vowels that kind of like people, will, that for, for, for Westerners, they put things in so that we can kind of understand it. But there aren't vowels. So it's made up of three consonants. And the word midbar is made up of the three consonants, D, B, R. OK, so that's literally, that literally means the place of speaking or the place of words. From the D, B, R, we also get the word debir, which means holy of holies. We also get the word dibar, which means the sheepfold. Now, why am I geeking out on these words with you? Basically, what this tells us is that to the Jewish people, the wilderness is the place where God gathers together his sheep, his flock, into his sheepfold, the Holy of Holies, to reveal his presence and to speak to us. If we want to hear God, If we want to come face to face with our need for Yahweh, we're going to see that happen in the wilderness. That's going to happen when we are in those moments that are not easy, in the moments that don't look simple, in the moments that, uh, that, that are difficult. That is when we are going to see God come. Now, Like I said before, uh, Abraham was a desert man. This was the journey that he took here from Ur of the Chaldees all the way up to Haran, first of all, and then down into the promised land. Uh, Abraham's story is amazing. I mean, so in the ancient world, you have to understand that the gods were angry. The people did not think that you could have a relationship with the gods. And so the sacrificial system originally was all about how can I appease these gods? Most of the gods were fertility gods. And so the idea was like, we, if, if we want to get a harvest, we're going to have to make sure that they are on our side. And so in Ur of the Chaldees, they worship these funny looking dudes. You've got Shamash and Sin, the god and goddess of the moon and the sun. And it's most rabbis believe and would talk about Abraham's father being a priest of these particular Mesopotamian gods. And uh, there's a brilliant rabbinical story of Abraham when God has appeared to him and God has revealed himself as the one true God and has said to him, go from your from your homeland to a land that I will show you. I'll bless you. Uh, and, And God makes this promise to him and Finally, Abraham sees that there is a true and living God. The story goes that Abraham, in the middle of the night, goes with a hammer and uh, with a mallet. And he goes and he and he smashes to pieces his father's idol. So there he goes. One, bam, smashes it to pieces. Another one, bam, smashes it to pieces. Each one of the idols he smashes to pieces apart from one. He leaves one of them standing and he puts the hammer Lent up against this particular idol. Okay? So his dad wakes up in the morning, the household's going crazy. What's happened? Who has done this? Who has who has destroyed my idols? And Abraham walks in and he's like, Well, Dad, I mean it's pretty obvious. Pretty obvious he's destroyed your idol. I mean, look, look, he's got it in his hand. You caught him red-handed, right? And his dad looks at him and he's like, Son, what are you talking about? They're just statues. And Abraham says, well, why do you bow down to them then? Again, it's probably apocryphal, but it's great. It's a great rabbinic story, isn't it? So good. And so Abraham leaves and dwells in the wilderness. This is a prototype of the tabernacle that they built uh, for, for the wilderness. But he meets with God in this amazing wilderness experience. Any questions so far? I know I'm going fast, but... (laughs) I sometimes, I sometimes issue a warning to the people on the front rows because I get very excited and sometimes they end up spraying the word of the Lord instead of saying the word of the Lord. So I think you'll be all right. That's why I'm kind of trying to stick over this side a little bit. OK, brilliant. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these images in the wilderness. Anybody want to hazard a guess? What do you think is the main cause of death in the wilderness? First, good, 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 good answer. Anything else? (laughs) 
So dehydration, yeah, sim- similar. Anything else that you can think of? Scorpions. Sorry? Scorpions. Scorpions. Do you know what? In my head, I thought you said dolphins, and I was like, <laughs> where, the heat is clearly getting to us, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, scorpions, yeah, yeah. Sunstroke. Uh, sunstroke, definitely. Hunger. Uh, Hunger. Hunger, yeah. Snakes. Snakes, yes. Yeah. I mean, back in, like, Bible times as well, and now, to be honest, um, hyenas would be an issue. Back in Bible times, they, you would have had the, uh, the lion and the, um, and the Asiatic bear as well that would have been a real danger. But you may be surprised to know that the number one cause of death in the wilderness, certainly the, uh, the, the desert areas around Israel, is actually flooding. Really? Yeah. Surprising, right? Really, really surprising. But that is the biggest danger in the, world, in, in the desert. Not many years ago, there was actually something on the news about some tourists who had ended up getting caught in some flash floods in, in the wilderness. The only reason that it was on our news here was because they were British. But this happens all the time in the wilderness. So the reason for this is that you have these wadis that are all over the wilderness. So in the mountains, 40 miles away, it will rain and it will, like, you'll get 40 inches of rain within six weeks, basically. Now, the mountains can't handle that. So it runs off and it goes down into the desert and it creates these huge canyons. Some of you may have seen these when you've been in Israel. They're spectacular. They're beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But they're caused by these rain pours. Uh, now, the problem is, is that they're really dangerous because it can look inviting you you're in the wilderness and it's it's so hot and you're looking for shade and you're looking for someone to go it can look so inviting to go into one of the wadis and of course there's water there more about that in a moment the problem is is that if it rains or if there's suddenly a breakthrough of the water that wadi will very quickly fill up with water and if you are there you and, and the rains come the, the, the people say that the Bedouins can smell rain from miles away. I don't know if that's true. But what they will do is they'll put a barrel on a, on a long rope and they'll bang it with an iron bar and it will reverberate. And basically the message is, get out quickly because the rain is coming. And uh, when that happens, if you don't get out quickly, you are a dead man. And uh, it says this in, in Psalm 40. One to four, it says, I waited patiently for Adonai till he turned toward me and heard my cry. He brought me up from the roaring pit, up from the muddy ooze and set my feet on a rock, making my footing firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will look on in awe and put their trust in Adonai, stuck in the miry clay. You know, when that water begins to subside, it leaves the thickest, ooziest, stickiest mud that you can ever imagine. If you get stuck in there, you are not getting out. Have you ever been in one of those situations? You ever been in a situation where you feel like you are stuck and there is no way to get out? Where it feels like all around there are chasms, canyon walls around you and you don't know where help is going to come from. And you're stuck. You're stuck in the miry clay and you know, you know that there is a flood coming and you know that something terrible is on the horizon. But you just don't know how to get out of that situation. Uh, I I grew up in a Christian family and uh, incredibly grateful for that. Definitely would say that I knew God growing up. Um, My mum was healed of terminal breast cancer when I was six, which had a massive impact on us as a family. Like I said, we uh, have always had a massive love for Israel and grew up with all of uh, with all of that background. Uh, And then when I got into my teens, there was a powerful move of the Holy Spirit that was impacting our church. Uh, Some of you will have heard of the group Delirious. Uh, that all came out of the youth group of my church at, at, that, at that time. And uh, it was amazing. It was an absolutely amazing time. But at the same time as that happening, I began to hang out with the wrong crowd. I started to experiment with drugs and with alcohol. Um, and right in the middle of all of that, we went through an ugly church split. 
And when that happens, if anybody's ever been through a church split, you'll know it's really difficult. You see people who once were very close friends acting in ways that just you just cannot kind of marry it up with the with the message of, of Jesus. And so I began to I was already going down quite a destructive path. But as I started going down that, I started to turn my back on church and think to myself, well, if that's what Christianity is all about, I don't want anything to do with that. Bunch of hypocrites. I was the biggest hypocrite of all. Don't get me wrong. Um, But I started to experiment with all of that. I was very into the punk grunge scene. There was a band called Nirvana. Some of you may remember their lead singer, Kurt Cobain, um, killed himself right at this same point. It all converged at the same, same point. And so I... Started on what I can only really describe was a three year period of uh, just a downward spiral of self destruction. And I became anorexic, I became bulimic, I dropped down to four stones, seven pounds. I know, right? The air always goes out of the room when I say that. Um, and uh, I, was, I tried to take my life on a number of occasions. I was having to see psychiatrists at the Maudsley Psychiatric Hospital in London every week. Bless them, my family had to come with me to, to visit this psychiatric hospital. And to be honest with you, I just always thought to myself, I'm just going to trick them long enough for them to let me go home and I'm just going to carry on doing what I want to do. And it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. I tried to look for meaning in all of the wrong places. I experimented with Eastern um, meditation and religion. I, uh, were, I threw myself into my studies. That was one positive thing because I kind of thought I was just looking for meaning, basically, looking for meaning in relationship, looking for meaning in all of these different places. And none of it was satisfying me, I guess, because I had known God. But I feel like I felt like he was so far away from me. I was just walking in a wadi. I was just walking and I was getting more and more stuck as the days went by. And I, everyone could see that the flood was coming. Everybody could see it. In fact, I walked into Cutting Edge, which was our youth event at the time. This was the, the event that Delirious came out of. And they were all praying and they were up in a gallery area uh, that overlooked the sports hall where we had this event. Thousands of young people come along to the event and they were looking out And they saw me walk in at the back and Martin Smith and his wife, Anna, who are very close friends of mine, they said, uh, we are not going to let Joe Kispy die. And they all began to pray for me and the church began to cry out to God. And I remember it like yesterday. I just finished my GCSEs and I walked into my bedroom and I just decided that was it. I didn't want to live anymore. I'd come to the end of myself. I knew that I'd done well in my studies and yet I still felt so, so empty. And I cried out to God because I knew that death wasn't the end. And I felt like I've got to settle accounts with God somehow because I have no idea what's going to happen when I actually do end my life. And so I remember saying, God, if you are there, you've got to do something because I just do not want to live anymore. And um, I remember saying this. I remember saying, God, I used to know know you, but I feel like you're so far away. I feel like there's absolutely no way to get back to you. And I said, if you can do anything with my life, I'll gladly give it to you because I've shown what a complete mess I can make of it on my own. But if not, that is it. I'm not leaving this bedroom alive. And now, over 23 years later, I still find it difficult to describe what happened. But something much bigger than me came into the room, knocked me to the ground. I had what I can only say was really an out-of-body experience. I stood before Jesus. I knew that I knew that I knew that it was Jesus. And um, I just felt like waves of liquid love that just hit me. And with each wave, it just washed out all of the rubbish and all of the junk and everything that I believed about myself. And I never forget what he said. He said, if you'll give me your life, I'll take you on an adventure that will leave you breathless, leave you wondering how on earth you could live the kind of life that I have called you to live. I remember just saying, God, I am in. I'm in. I want it. And uh, I came out of that experience a totally changed person. All of my desire to get off of my head with drugs and alcohol was gone. Just in in an instant, gone. I didn't have any withdrawals, even from cigarettes. Didn't have any withdrawals from any of that. And then I experienced what Romans 12, 1 says uh, about not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. I read through the scriptures, the whole of the scriptures, over 10 times between May of 1997 and the end of that year, the New Testament a further seven times. 
times just because I was, I'm not saying this to, to, to blow my own trumpet, because I was so hungry for God. I wanted to meet with him. I wanted to know him. He had pulled me out of the miry clay. He pulled me out of that place where I was sure that I was going to drown. But God rescued me. And there's something about the picture, isn't there? It could have been me. It could have been you. But Jesus reached in and pulled us out and turned it all around. Psalm 23 says that he leads us beside still water. Now, this is not still water. This is still water. The difference between still water and this water is that this water has come from a flood. This has come from where a wadi potentially could break through. But if I'm a sheep, which never sounds right in the singular, but if I'm a sheep, how do I know the difference? How do I know that going and listening to all of this music and and smoking weed and doing all of these things, how do I know that that's not still water? How do I know where I'm supposed to get my sustenance from, where I'm supposed to go if I'm thirsty? How do I know? You have to listen to the voice of your shepherd because he's the one who knows. It is only the shepherd. Sheep are pretty stupid, right? I mean, they'll just see water and they'll just think, I'm just going to go and I'm going to drink. But only the shepherd knows where the safe places are to drink. He's the one that leads us to where we need to get to, to what we need to be to, to need to drink. Now, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to uh, keep running forward. So also says in Psalm 23, it says he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, whenever we think of that scripture, we, we think of something like this, right? We think of like belly deep alfalfa, loads of like uh, beautiful fields and meadows. And we kind of like have this image in our mind. This is the reality. Those are the green pastures of Psalm 23. Did you know that? It's not, I know it doesn't look quite as dramatic. It doesn't quite look as exciting. I remember being in Israel with my grandfather and we were near, um, we were quite near the Dead Sea. It was a spectacular moment because we had all of these sheep and goats were all kind of like mixed together. And we saw the four shepherds and uh, I'll talk to you a bit about shepherds in a bit. They wandered off in four different directions and they just began to whistle. They began to sing and all of the sheep just filtered out and began to follow their different shepherds. They knew the voice of their shepherds, and they went. But there was hardly any green around. And I remember saying to my granddad, I remember saying, what do these sheep eat? Are they like, are they rock-eating sheep? I mean, what earth do they eat? And one of the guys who was a guy who was with us, and he begins to laugh, and he's kind of, they're used to us Westerners not having any idea. And he said, well, you, you Westerners try to make Psalm 23, as if it's like this abundance of grass. The green pastures, they come in the morning when the humid breeze comes in off of the Mediterranean and they cause this green to to appear. It'll only be there for a couple of days because when the sun begins to beat down on that, it is gone in hardly any time at all. And the image here is that God will give us what we need for whatever moment we are in. This is the daily bread. This is the green pastures. And so you see these sheep and they wander around and they get a mouthful here and a mouthful there. And it's not, there's not an abundance of food, but it is exactly what they need for the moment. Now, let me ask you, anybody in this room, is there anything that you don't have right now that you don't need in this moment, other than maybe like, other than maybe a a restroom break or whatever it might be. Is there anything that you don't have at the moment that you desperately, desperately need in this moment? No. God gives us what we need for the moment. Now, during this time of COVID, the anxiety levels have shot through the roof like never before. And I'm convinced that our anxiety, all of our worry, all of our concern is all about trying to control things that we can't control. And in the West, we have this desperate desire to want to be able to control everything. A great rabbi once said that worry is trying to deal with tomorrow's problems with today's pastures. Right. We do that all the time. We worry about tomorrow and we think we need to have what we need for tomorrow in our hands today. But God gives us what we need for the moment that we need it. 
And he does this so that we will be dependent upon him. You know, the, one of the reasons why the Jewish people see the wilderness as their honeymoon period with God was because God provided for them every step of the way, whether it was water from a rock, whether it was manna falling from heaven, God provided for them in the moment. And it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says, be careful when you come into the land. Because when you come into the land and you own houses that you didn't build and vineyards that you didn't plant, you will look at it and you will say, I did this by my strength. And you will forget the Lord your God who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant in the earth as it is this day. We are so used to doing things in our own strength. We are so used to doing it in our own ability that most of the time we don't even really need God. We think, oh, we'll be absolutely fine. When you are in the wilderness, if God doesn't show up, if he is not there providing shade for your head where the sun will not not strike you by day nor the moon by night, we are going to be in trouble. That is why it's so important to come into the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you, but for many people, this season has felt like a wilderness moment, hasn't it? It's felt like so many of the things that we, we, we need for our sustenance, whether that is going to church and being spoon fed the word of God or being spoon fed a, a, a worship experience, it's been taken away. Our community and being able to share with each other has been taken away. There's so many things that are the usual crutches that we go to that have been taken from us. And it has been a wilderness in so many ways. But I believe that God has been meeting with us during this time. I'm going ahead of myself, so I'm just going to just want to share a couple more things with you quickly. This is a this is one of the shades that you see in the wilderness. Says this in Jeremiah 17, 5 to 6. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush. Say bush. In the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives Now, when our brilliant Bible translators came and they translated the Bible, there were so many things that they didn't know how to translate in a way that it would really describe the thing that they're talking about. And so we have this word bush that they use here in in, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 6. But that bush is the word arara. Say with me, arara. 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 Now, this is an arara bush. Now, can you imagine you're in the wilderness and you see this bush and it's dry and you're thirsty and you're desperate for some shade. And and, and as soon as you see green in the wilderness, your eye is immediately attracted to it. And these bushes are incredible. They grow out in the middle of nowhere. They have a root system that goes down really, really, really deep. Now, they also have this fruit that grows on it. And so, you know, if you're ever there and you're with some students or whatever, they'll be like, wow, this is amazing. Can you eat this? Can you eat this fruit? It would be so awesome if you could eat it. And they go over and they take the fruit of the arara tree and they split it open. And inside there's this like cobwebby kind of like textured thing. And there's a tiny pip and a little bit of, um, of, of, of liquid. And that's it. And... Um, <clears throat> It's actually very poisonous. They, the Bedouins put this on their, on their arrows. They use it to shoot at hyenas. So it's, it's very poisonous what is inside the arara tree. So why does Jeremiah use this image? It's fascinating to me. It really, it absolutely touches my soul. Because what Jeremiah is saying here is if you are trusting in your own strength, or in the strength of other people, whether that is the great scientists that are are, are coming up with vaccines. Thank God for all of them. But if we are trusting in that, if we are trusting in the arm of the flesh, if we're trusting in our own ability, we are an arara in the wilderness. And an arara looks great on the outside. It looks beautiful. It looks good. It looks fruitful. It looks special. But if you split it open... On the inside, it's only death and emptiness. And this speaks to me so much because, again, going back to my testimony, I had done so much in my strength and it was all empty and broken. 
And we see this image throughout the scriptures. But then Jeremiah goes on and he says this, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now, these grow in the wilderness as well. This is hyssop. Uh, and hyssop is used throughout the scriptures on many, many occasions. I don't, I don't want to take up too much time, but it's used in the, when they brush the, the, the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. Uh, it was, it, it's there at the cross. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about hyssop is that hyssop could be boiled down and turned into a type of, um, a type of acid. In fact, you can buy a type of acid and it's still called hyssop. And so the, one of the main uses of it in Bible times was to separate the, uh, the, the leather from the bones. They would use hyssop for that. Now, put that into Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, David says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be made clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. What is he saying? He's saying, God, burn this out of me. Burn it away. And we miss it again because we don't understand the wilderness. Very quickly, the covered head. This is the broom tree, rotum, it's called in Hebrew. And it's the only real form of shade that you find in the wilderness. And most of the time, it's only enough to cover your head. In fact, they say in, in, in the wilderness, they'll say it's the uncovered head that kills people. It's the uncovered head. And most people, they don't want to wear a hat. But people don't realise that in the same way as... It's the main place where he leaves your body. It's also the main place that he enters your body as well. And so it's the uncovered head that kills people. And it says this in um, Psalm 121, a song of ascent. It says, it says that Adonai is our guardian at our right hand. He provides us with shade for our head, it actually says in Hebrew. The sun will not strike us by day and the moon, nor the moon by night. In the desert, the moon is all about cold. At night, Adonai will guard you against all harm. He will guard your life. Adonai will guard your coming and going from now on and forevermore. One last very quick image from the wilderness. You've got these two images. You've got the rock and you've got honey. Now, if you've ever had the opportunity to be in a yeshiva, you'll know that the rabbis do this beautiful thing with the preschoolers where they'll bring out a a brand new Torah. They'll give them a Torah and then they'll bring out rice paper and they'll put honey on the rice paper. And then all of the children there with their sticky fingers in the rice paper, they'll put it in their mouths. And the rabbi will say to them, now never forget that is what God tastes like. That is what God tastes like. Honey is always symbolic throughout the scriptures of the, uh, of the word of God. And I love this. In Psalm 81, it says this. My people did not listen to my voice. Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to live by their own plans. How I wish my people would listen to me. That Israel would live by my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate Adam and I would cringe before him while Israel's time would last forever. They would be fed with the finest of wheat and I would satisfy you with honey from the rocks. Now, there are rocks on life's pathway. I I don't know you guys, but I am sure that within this room, there are all kinds of different rocks. There might be some that are pebbles. There might be some that seem like huge, whacking great boulders that you just don't know how you are going to get over. Uh, There must be situations in your families, with your loved ones, with your workplace, with your churches. There are these difficult, dry and barren things. But the promise of God is that he will bring honey from those those difficult situations that he will reveal himself in a way that his word will become real his truth will become clear and he will carry us over those situations he'll satisfy us with honey from the rock i love that image last one shepherds shepherds in the wilderness and i'm not going to talk too much about uh, about this but the in the ancient culture shepherds in the Bedouin culture even now would almost always be young girls pre-adolescent girls sometimes boys most of the time it would be girls they'd always go out in at least twos now 
the guys would be there. You might be saying to me, well, what did the guys do? Well, not much of much, to be honest. And you could argue that things haven't changed that much in, uh, in the West either. But it would be the girls that would do the majority of the work. And they would. And even now, if you go to Israel, you'll see this, particularly in the, be- in the Bedouin culture. You'll see the girls out there doing this incredible work. And they'll be leading the sheep and the sheep will know their voice. And um, it's absolutely beautiful. Now, put that in your Christmas card as well, because those well, we miss this so often because we think that we, 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 we think that they were these big guys. And this changes the way that I see the Lord is my shepherd as well, because if we see God as this big guy with a stick ready to correct us and everything, that that's not the image that they would have understood when they when they read this. And you may say to me, well, why was David out there? Well, we know from the rabbinic tradition that David was under the age of 12 when he was looking after the sheep. We also know that he wasn't thought of much by his father. So it's very likely that for that reason, he was out there looking after the sheep. But they would have always been young and they would have more often than not been female, which is absolutely fascinating i love that now the uh the, the the eastern people will talk about when the sun goes down and the shadows come and when the shadows come the shepherds will move from being at the front of their flock to being right in the middle right in the center of their flock now the reason for that is that uh sheep are very obedient but they will they'll do anything to follow the voice of their shepherd and they don't really care if there is a canyon in between them and their shepherd if their shepherd starts to call them they'll walk even if it if they walk right off of the off of the cliffside and so they'll come and they'll be right in the middle even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death you are with me and what david is saying is that our shepherd isn't there ahead of us saying, come on, guys, don't you realise? Come over this way. He comes right into the middle, right into that place where we need to meet with him. So Jesus goes into the world. Jesus identifies with the children of Israel. He goes into that place. I mean, in as much as it was the honeymoon period with Yahweh, it was also known as the territory of the enemy. It was where they would send the scapegoat out into the wilderness. And so Jesus goes into hand-to-hand combat with the enemy. And he's out there and he fights the devil off with Deuteronomy. I love that every scripture that Jesus quotes is Deuteronomy. He fights the devil off with that. And every time says it is written. And he, you know, when it talks about Jesus going into the wilderness for 40 days, it uses the word quarantine in in Latin. It would be the word quarantine. And we've been in a period, it's not been a real quarantine, but we've been in a period of isolation. We've been in a period of quarantine. But the fascinating thing about this story is that Jesus comes out of the wilderness. It says in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, Yeshua returned to the Galil in the power of the Spirit. He was led out full of the Spirit, but he returns in the dunamis, in the power of the Spirit. And reports about him spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their synagogues. Everyone respected him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. On Shabbat, he went to the synagogue as usual. He stood up to read. He was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of Adonai is upon me. Therefore, he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of the favour of Adonai. Quarantine. 40 days. I don't need to geek out with you guys on the significance of the number 40, but 40 is always the Jewish number of preparation. When God is getting ready to prepare anything, he does it in 40. A child, a gestation period for a baby in the womb of its mother is 40 weeks. It's 40 times seven, the number of perfection. It's so beautiful. God does this, 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 this work of preparation. Uh, Jesus was definitely following in the tradition of the Essenes who would have all been dissident priests. They would have all been Levites who basically said, 
the temple is so corrupt. We are, we are starting a back to the roots movement. We're going back to the wilderness. Just like where God originally spoke to us, we're going back to that place. And John the Baptist, who is this voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, comes with this message of teshuva, repentance. Which repentance is about a lot more than just a, uh, a call out of sin. And it is actually a term that means to return, to come back. It is a homecoming. It is a return to original design. We focused in the Protestant church a lot on original sin. The Bible focuses much more on original design. You and I were called to be the image bearers, the selim of God. We were called to reveal to the world something that is completely different. And to do that, we need to come home. We need to come back. We need to to step into that place and so Jesus identifies with the, with this season of quarantine he goes into the wilderness he goes into this time even though he didn't need to be refined in the fire but to show us that we need to be refined in the fire we need to go into that place where where God allows the things to come to the surface isn't it fascinating that during this time of COVID so many things have risen to the surface issues of sin in the church have risen to the surface uh, systemic racism has risen to the surface in such a, a, a visible and dramatic way. Now, I don't believe that God does this to shame us. I believe that God does it so that the great refiner can come and scoop away the dross. And you, we know the, the, the refiner knows that the gold is ready when he can see his reflection in it. I believe that God is looking for a church where we are so full of God's spirit, so full of God's presence that all mankind will be able to see it. I love this Isaiah 40. It says a voice cries out, clear a road through the desert for Adonai. Level a highway in the Aravah for our God. Let every valley be filled, every mountain and hill lowered. The bumpy places made level and the crags become a plain. Then, say then. The glory of Adonai will be revealed. All humankind, come on, this is what we're living for. All humankind together will see it. For the mouth of Adonai has spoken. Who are we? And what are we doing here? We are called to be that voice in the wilderness. We are called to go through that process. We are called to be refined in the fire. We are called to step into that place of midbar as God's great flock, where we step into the holy of holies, where we hear his voice and his voice transforms us from the inside out so that the world can see his glory. Lord God, I just thank you so much for this amazing group of ordinary radicals doing extraordinary things, Lord, with their lives. I pray, God, that we would not run from the wilderness, but that we would run to the wilderness, that we would embrace that place of speaking, God, that even when it is difficult, we would meet with you face to face, God, that we would hear your voice, that we would look into the eyes of the lover of our souls and we would be transformed. You say that when we behold your glory, glory. We are transformed from glory to glory. So God, I pray that we would come out of this season, this season that has been difficult, that seemed dry, that seemed barren, that seemed uh, painful in so many ways, that Lord, that we would come out of this season in the power of the Holy Spirit and that everywhere we go, the kingdom of heaven would break out like never before. In Jesus' powerful name. All God's people said amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions, please, please don't feel like you need to stay. If you need to shoot off, I totally understand. But if anybody has any questions, I'm just going to stick around for a while. Please do feel free to, to ask. Thanks, guys. No, I don't. I wish I did. I'd love to do. I'd love to go to um, Israel and do Opan at one point, which is where you go and you just basically just speak the whole time. But I think my wife and I will probably do something like that when our kids are just a little bit older. I speak fluent Spanish. <laughs> yeah, lived out in Colombia um, twice now. One, first time for two years, second time for four years. It's called the Complete Jewish Bible. CJB. So if you've got the U version app on your phone, you, you can get it there. Yeah, so the app, um, you, can, you can get it for free on there. But if you prefer uh, an actual physical Bible, I know that they've got it in the bookshop. I've no idea how much they're selling it for, but it is, it, it's really, really good. Yeah. It's really great. And there's a commentary that goes along with it. Originally, the guy who did it, um, 
David Stern, that's right, David Stern. I always get mixed up with David Flusser, but David Stern, who did it originally, he brought out a commentary that goes alongside it, which is absolutely fantastic as well. Definitely encourage that. If anybody is like, I, I know that, again, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, people will often ask me where's a really good place to start looking into some of these things. I would say one of the <coughs> best books to, to read is Our Father Abraham. Really, really great book. God in Search of Man by Joshua Abraham um, uh, Heschel. Absolutely fantastic book to read. Um, there's so many, though. There's so many good things out there. So it's a, and, and then I would also say there's so many great resources online now as well. Uh, if you've ever come across Blue Letter Bible, you can go on Blue Letter Bible and you can see the Strong's Concordance word for any. And it will also take you back to the root word as well, which is always a really fascinating thing to do. So one of the things that massively enriches your Bible reading is any time that you see a name whether it's a name of a place or whether it's a name of a person, check out what it means. Because everybody that reads, all of our Jewish brothers and sisters, when they read that, they, they know straight away. They know straight away that, um, that the, the names of the wells, for instance. I just preached on Hagar and God meeting with Hagar in the wilderness and such a beautiful story. I know that often whenever Hagar is talked about, Hagar and Ishmael is talked about, it's always talked about in a very negative way, but there's so much of the fingerprint of the God of compassion and love all over that. Ishmael is the first person in the Bible that is actually named by God. And Isha, Ish and Isha means man and woman. Um, Shema is to call, to cry out, and El would be God. So Ishmael's name essentially means God hears the cry of mankind. That's what his name means. And God reveals that name at a place that, that where he essentially says to Hagar, I'm the God that sees you. Uh, I said in my talk, you know, Oprah Winfrey said after all of her years interviewing so many people, somebody said to her, what is the main thing that you have learned about human nature? And she said, everybody's basically asking three questions. Do you see me? Do you hear me? And do you care? And in that story, God says, I see you, I hear you, and I care, and I've made a plan. And there's so much, this, you know, it's so beautiful, because when that happens, she's, she's run back to Egypt. She's on the border of Egypt. She's on the eastern border in a place called Shur, which means the wall. So she's hit up against a metaphorical and a physical wall, and yet there's a well there. There's a well when we hit the wall, and that well is the place where God meets her. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop. 